Welcome, everyone. I'm Drew Clark, editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast, and happy to welcome you to Broadband Breakfast Live Online. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, and we are going to be talking about precision agriculture today. Uh, the spring is one of my favorite times of the year. I guess it is my favorite season, and uh, it reminds me of, of planting. Um, I've got in the background uh, one of paintings. I'm sorry, it's a little blurry. Uh, a paint, original painting by a, a Illinois famed Illinois uh, artist, uh, and this was was on our wall for for the uh, nearly four years that uh, my family and I lived in in Illinois. Uh, it was a great experience for me, and I'm really happy to welcome a number of uh, Illinoisans back to talk about this topic that is, of course, important to many states. Uh, I don't mean to preference Illinois unfairly, but it is, of course, uh, of, of huge concern to, to to Illinois, to the Midwest. And 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 talking specifically about agriculture and broadband is something we're going to be doing just now here. But but uh, bear with me. I want to just say a few other things uh, uh, about um, that are going on with broadband breakfast right now. Uh, it's a it's an exciting time, of course, because of the uh, build out of broadband through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the BEAD program, um, the Middle Mile program, uh, the Digital Equity program, which of course is very well integrated into the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment program, as well as the Capital Projects Funds and many state efforts. In fact, Illinois was one of the first states to really push forward with its own state uh, funding for broadband long before, even before the pandemic, right? So, so we're we're definitely um, uh, going to be talking about uh, uh, the role that states uh, have played and and continue to play. And and today we're going to be talking about some some other really cool things on the federal level too. But uh, because broadband uh, is is so important right now, broadband breakfast is at a very exciting moment. We we talk about the infrastructure but we also talk about the application and use. And Precision Ag may be a great, great case, specialized case perhaps, but a, a, a wonderful case of the importance of broadband to what we call better broadband, better lives. The, the, the importance of having high capacity broadband and making use of it. And so at Broadband Breakfast, we report every day on America's broadband build out. We are the community for better broadband, better lives. We about a month and a half ago relaunched a Broadband Breakfast, the website. If you haven't been there, encourage you to come to, to sign in uh, as a free member of the Broadband Breakfast community. You can get uh, at least 13 articles a month for free. And we encourage you to uh, up level to the Broadband Breakfast Club where you get unlimited access to all of the content on Broadband Breakfast. You also get unlimited access to the videos of the events that, that we do. And I'm going to say another word about that is just now. And you also get our exclusive reports, which we are, are upping the pace on from one a month last year to two a month. We, we just did a, a super in-depth report on the digital discrimination order and, and another one on the rip and replace program, which has actually effect, affected a lot of, of rural providers as well. And the one that's coming out very soon is on spectrum sharing. So you have to be a Breakfast Club member to get access to, to those. And it's uh, $99 a month or $590 uh, for a year's subscription to Broadband Breakfast. I, I did say I was going to say another word or two about our upcoming events. Uh, and you can go on Broadband Breakfast just to the, the top across the top. You can just click on events. Uh, that takes you to all of our in-person events. Across the tab top, you can see about our free broadband live events, which, which is, of course, this is one, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But we are super excited to be doing the California Broadband Summit at the Cal Matters Ideas Festival. This is on June fifth and sixth. Uh, still two months away, but uh, not not too uh, late to plan for that. So we 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 care about those out in the West Coast too. Give a little love to to them out there and and. Uh, we're, we're going to be very excited to be there in person for a, a regional um, summit, if you will, on the role of broadband in California. Of course, we will be doing the Broadband Infrastructure Investment Event uh, again this year in, in September 19th. And I'm really, really happy to highlight 
two other in-person events that have come along uh, next Wednesday in lieu of the normal Broadband Breakfast Live Online, or I should say, in addition to the normal Broadband Breakfast Live Online, we are going to be in person and live online. This is a special event that we're doing with uh, our sponsor, NCTA, the Internet and, Tele the Internet and Television Association, and uh, it's going to start an hour early. So you got to either be there a little before 11 or log online 11 o'clock, same time, 11 Eastern time. So, of course, 10 Central, et cetera. Um, and it's going to be on achieving Internet for all, addressing discrimination and rurality. So in some ways, it's kind of off a lot of the issues we'll talk about here today on agriculture and rural areas. We're going to be talking about a report that Paul Garnett of the Vernonburg Group has produced on achieving Internet for all. And it'll be followed by a panel discussion with FCC Bureau Chief uh, Alejandro Roark, uh, Rob Branson, uh, CEO of the Minority Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council, Catherine DeWitt, who almost needs no introduction of the Pew Charitable Trusts, John Yang of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and of course, yours truly will be moderating it. So uh, whether you are in Washington and want to come in person for free, or you want to log on to Broadband Breakfast Live online one hour early for free, you can do so. Just go to Broadband Breakfast to access it. We're also very excited about the next week, uh, which I'll, I'll defer to a later time. And future weeks, we're going to be uh, getting into some very exciting topics on clean energy and smart cities uh, and their role and the role that broadband has in those developments. So I've spoken quite long, but I have just one more thing to say. It is thank you to the sponsors of Broadband Breakfast that enable us to do this free programming every Wednesday at noon, except next week, it's gonna be at 11 o'clock Eastern time. And those sponsors include Utopia Fiber, Comcast, SmartWave Technologies, Ookla, Westco, Ku Systems, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Community Broadband Networks Initiative, National Cable and Telecommunications Association, the California Emerging Technology Fund, Broadband Toolkit, Google Fiber, Broadband Now, Michael Baker International, and Ookla. Thank you to the support of our sponsors that makes these free events possible. All right, let's open it up to our panel. I'm going to introduce them and kick it over to them because other than being around and loving being in the heartland, uh, Illinois, seeing soybeans and corn get traded off every year, uh, the, the the crop rotation, I know next to nothing about agriculture or precision agriculture, which is what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, kicking off our discussion will be Jim Couples. Jim is... Um, the an advisor to the Precision Ag Connectivity and Accuracy Stakeholder Alliance. And he's been working with the ag community on technical projects for six years. He frequently works with Oregon State University Engineering Department to sponsor capstone projects that meet local farmers' needs, often resulting in prototypes. I'm sure he'll also tell us a lot about Peg Casa, its fascination with broadband mapping, and it's a very significant contribution to this discussion. So, Jim, thanks for being with us. Jim will be followed by Laurel Levier. Uh, she is the Assistant Administrator of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service. Thank you so much for making time to be with us, Laurel. Uh, and as the Assistant Administrator of RUS, she oversees a six billion dollar portfolio of loans and grants. And she has uh, had a 19 year career at USDA and has worked in many positions, including the American Broadband Initiative uh, and other federal working groups. And she'll be able to contribute as well to discussion about this task force on precision agriculture that the FCC and USDA have, have worked on. She'll be followed by Matt Schmidt. Matt is the director of the Illinois Office of Broadband, uh, and he integrates 21st century infrastructure and service delivery into its primary uh, focus. Um, Matt previously was a senator in his home state of Mi Minnesota and has served on many legislative boards in broadband deployment, transportation, and investment, and um, has also served on the Cook County Council of Digital Equity. That's Cook County, Illinois, right, Matt? That's right. 
Okay. I was, was doing a double take. Is there another Cook County? No, but uh, Matt, you know, you've been on, we've, we've been on broadband breakfast events and we did an ask me anything as well. So, so excited to have you back uh, and, and have several of your um, fellow uh, Illinoisans uh, with you. Uh, so just, just to close out on Matt, um, uh, he, he was um, uh, part of the Agriculture Utilization Research Institute's board uh, the Blandin Broadband Strategies Board, and Blandin's played a very significant role in broadband in Minnesota, uh, and also represented Minnesota on the National Conference of State Legislators, Nuclear Energy Work Group, and Commerce Committee, as well as being an active member of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. All right, rounding out to our real specialists in uh, agriculture, we have uh, 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 Dennis Bowman, who is an extension specialist for digital agriculture at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign, with more than four decades of experience in commercial agricultural education. Dennis has been at the forefront of cutting edge technologies into farming. And for those, I did not know this till I lived in Illinois, who don't know what extension is all about. I mean, you're missing out. Extension is really the lifeline of integrating knowledge education into practical use in farming communities. So tell us more about extension and its role when you when we turn to you, Dennis. And then our final speaker will be Todd Main, and he is the market, the director of market development for the Illinois Soybean Association. And he develops new strategies in support of the Soybean Association's goals in trade, animal agriculture, transportation, and logistics. So again, uh, let's uh, delve right into it. Um, Jim. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, and it's great to be on this panel, um, especially hearing everyone's backgrounds. Um, so as you mentioned, Drew, I work for Picasa. I'm an advisor with them. I'm often the person with boots on the ground that goes and visits farms one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, you are also really correct. You still there? Mapping. <laughs> we are obsessed with mapping. Uh, um, you don't have precision agriculture without broadband. Um, broadband is the the roads that you know. If precision agriculture is a vehicle, broadband is the road that allows them to travel upon. So it's that's why we've been obsessed with um, with maps and really broadband policy. Um, and lately, of course, that's been focused on bead. Um, I think we're, we're all kind of in the midst of that. I know that uh, Illinois was just pretty busy with their challenge process. I'm friends with uh, Alexis Shruby, who's a, a wonderful advocate for, for broadband around the state, urban and rural together. Um, specifically, you know, precision agriculture to me, I'm going to try not to ramble, ramble too long. I'm going to look at the clock. But when I think about precision agriculture and what it means, it means... Um, it means helping farmers, and that's important for one reason. Farmers have the potential to be our country's leading conservationist when it comes to the environment. They're the ones that can have the biggest impact. So enabling them to have the proper tools um, to adjust you know, their fertilizer, their water, um, all of that has to happen with precision agriculture. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why this matters so much, most, so much to me is that farmers really have the potential to be in the leading spot for fixing um, our environment. I work very often with small farms, um, you know, and, and of course we've done some work with larger farms. I'm in Eastern Washington right now, up in the Northeastern corner, the other Washington, not Washington, DC, the state right over here by Canada and Idaho. Um, out by us, we've got a lot of ranches. We've got a lot of wheat. Um, those are probably the two big things here. Um, and both of those uh, demand precision agriculture or precision ranch um, for the other side of that. Um, that's really important as well. Adjusting feed, tracking livestock, keeping track of vaccines, all those things, all those things depend upon good record keeping. And uh, to do that, you need broadband. Um, so I just want to track it back to bead for a second. Bead is can be phenomenal for rural communities, and it's all going to be about the execution of bead. And yeah, maps are a big deal. 
Um, you know, I work directly with the county out here in eastern Washington right now, which um, was undercut the amount of BSLs, broadband serviceable locations, by about a third. A third of the BSLs in the county weren't there on the maps. Um, and that's, that's often just a factor of lack of staffing for the smallest counties. And uh, Matt, as someone that's heading up the state, um, I'm guessing that you might be able to sympathize with that comment. Um, Cook County is probably pretty good on staff for GIS and those matters. However, the smaller counties might struggle. And um, Laura, I'm sure you might be able to speak to that as well. Um, I'll close it out now by just saying um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about precision agriculture. And I probably know a little bit more about smaller to medium-sized farms, family farms, how they use precision agriculture, then I will about really big soybean operations and others like that. And there, there's a place for all of us, we're all necessary, uh, but where, where I work is really at the intersection between uh, small, medium-sized farms, what they need from technology and trying to facilitate that. And, and broadband is just consistently a part of that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Let's uh, turn to Laurel. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your interaction with precision agriculture at USDA. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're at. Um, as Drew said, I'm Laurel Leverier. I work at the USDA and I oversee the USDA's telecommunications programs. And, you know, I think in the last decade, there's just been amazing to watch as technology has advanced and the work that I do now is just really so complemented across the department uh, with our work around precision agriculture. Um, so most of my time is spent overseeing our telecom programs, uh, which is focused on extending broadband into unserved areas. Um, but, you know, I think, as I mentioned, there's just such a synergy between that work and uh, what we're doing at the department with precision agriculture. Um, I get to work closely with the FCC on the precision ag task force that we both uh, work hand in hand on. And that's a really great um, place where it's actually um, the, the task force is comprised of folks in the public sector and in the, the I'm sorry, in the private sector. Um, and, you know, the intention there is to help advise uh, both the FCC and USDA on work that we can do to help support expansion of precision ag and really meeting uh, farmers and ranchers uh, where they're at. And it's really been so informative uh, for our agency in terms of uh, work that we can do to help better support that. Um, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but, you know, we know that precision ag can have such a positive impact on farming and ranching, um, increasing outputs, uh, improving health of livestock and plants, um, and ultimately just improving our overall ag sector, which our country is so lucky to have such a strong agricultural sector. Um, and we're just really proud to be able to support these efforts. Uh, we have over time done a lot of research around precision ag. And in my office, we spend a lot of time talking about how the work that we do to help finance broadband networks can help support that. Uh, we know that access to broadband uh, creates better economic outcomes for communities, uh, creates opportunities for jobs, and um, healthcare opportunities through telemedicine. Um, but I think Precision Ag is another place where having access to broadband really helps to improve overall um, outcomes for our communities. And it's really amazing uh, watching as the technology continues to advance. And I'm certainly not the expert on that. I think some of the other folks on our panel are. Uh, but as uh, just a, a, a viewer of all of this, you know, seeing how farms are able to take advantage and, you know, reduce water usage, uh, monitor livestock to ensure, um, you know, the health of um animals. And it just really, again, 
is amazing to see as technology is improving and more accessibility to precision ag is, is made available uh, for our farmers across America. Uh, well, with that, Drew, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, great. And we'll come back to you and others to speak more specifically about the task force and its work. Uh, obviously, it it um, it was authorized by the Farm Bill of uh, 2018, and even though that Farm Bill um, was not renewed in 2023, normally a five-year thing, it was extended for one year till the end of this year. So, I want to kind of understand specifically about the Precision Ag Task Force. Uh, but let's let's keep going to our other panelists. Matt, uh, you're on the ground in Illinois. Tell us uh, tell us what's going on with Precision Ag in the land of Lincoln. Yeah, thanks again, Drew, for the interest in uh, all things Illinois and also uh, this topic. It, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, you mentioned in the introduction my my exposure to broadband and, and agriculture actually goes back to a previous life in the, the Minnesota legislature. And at the same time, I was holding the, the gavel as vice chair of the Minnesota Senate Agriculture Committee and also trying to create uh, Minnesota's Office of Broadband and Border to Border Broadband Grant Program. And precision agriculture was a really great example of a use case in why broadband is so important. It it's not just giving everybody access to connect to the internet, but it's that cascade of benefit benefits for the environment, for productivity, for yield, et cetera. And so uh, it goes back over a decade now, and we've seen so many advances across the country. And of course, that brings us to here in Illinois, a state that's investing big in broadband. And also, you know, we're in the middle of everything here uh, in the heartland. You see innovations in technology and uh, a real dedication to getting it right when it comes to agriculture. And so I'm very proud of the work that's, that's taking place in, in Illinois. And I think the focus on precision agriculture right now is really important because as we look at that billion dollar investment that is the bead program that's coming towards us, we're able to look at precision agriculture, not just as a, an example for how to sell investment in broadband, but as a way to make sure that we get the most out of that investment on the back end. And so really exciting to be talking about this topic. And again, really look forward to learning from my panelists here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. And again, we'll 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 come back to you uh, to talk specifically. But let's let's hear from our our two other panelists. Um, uh, Todd, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Drew. Uh, yeah, Todd Mayne. I'm with the Illinois Soybean Association. We represent about forty three thousand producers here in Illinois, and our interest in this issue is, and in broadband in particular is just comes from our our deep understanding of, of the impact and how important it is for rural communities. And as we started to, to engage on this level, uh, following the great work that's being done at USDA and, and then at our own state office of broadband, we came to understand that the real issue for our folks in rural communities in Illinois was a capacity challenge. Mm -hmm. And our folks didn't have the ability to put plans together that could capture the money that's gonna be available from the BEAD program and others. And so that's what we've done and with our partners at the Benton Institute and uh, Illinois State and others is we wanted to put together a training program that would take engaged members of counties, rural counties, and give them the skills so that they could put plans together that would end up uh, being competitive. And they'd be able to capture the dollars that would go into this. And to date, we've we've trained 17 counties in how to how to capture that federal money in Illinois uh, so that they can make a difference in their in their towns. And we've done some some kind of innovative things with developing um, some some uh, methodology that allows you to do a, a vertical asset inventory of your county. So you can find out where the high points are, so you can link the technology together. Uh, we've developed uh, uh, through the extension uh, partners in the extension service, put, you know, taught people how to do speed tests, so they can figure out exactly what's going on, where it is, and uh, and you know the goal here is you know this is a once in a generation opportunity, and we got to get it right, and so we've got to have uh, good data and good people on the ground who know what they need in their counties, because it's not a cookie cutter. Our state is long and it's diverse uh, geography. And there are places in Southern Illinois where there are lots of hills and cell phone signals don't work very often. 
Uh, and then there's lots of flat land and then there's uh, lots of trees. And so uh, we want to give people the skills that can can make a difference for them. I'm going to push and try to get a little more specifics here, uh, Todd. So, so I want to understand what does precision agriculture mean specifically and how does it impact soybean industry in particular? So like, what does a farmer need to know more specifically than I'm going to, on this date, you know, put, put plants in my tractor and, and run it down. Like, tell me specifically what it is that precision agriculture gets that the farmer wasn't getting when they weren't doing that. Well, let me give you an example that kind of captures it uh, at a larger scale. But then I'd like to let Dennis talk about that because he's really in the weeds on this more so than, than even we are. But to give you an example of it, you know, used to be we would looked at the farmer um, farmer's almanac to tell us what the weather was going to be. And when we'd plant and when we'd harvest and, and that sort of thing. Well, today we're mapping out microclimates in fields and putting sensors in the soil that tell us how much the water content is in the soil and how much nutrients we need to put on the soil and what sort of uh, additives that need to happen. Um, and that is a data management challenge at one level, but it's also very precise. And so one of the uh, advantages that we're gonna have uh, as we become better at managing this data and capturing it uh, is that we're going to be much more efficient. And one of the challenges that we're looking at is we could see a 15 to 30% productivity increase in the next couple of decades. And that means a lot when, it, when we talk about things like global food security. Because in Illinois, 60% of our soybeans go to feed the world. Okay. But I think Dennis can give you a better answer than I can. Well, let's round out our panel, hear from Dennis, and then we'll we'll dive in everyone. So Dennis, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Um, just like you said, with extension, a lot of, some people don't know about extension. Um, the uh, traditional title has been the Cooperative Extension Service. A lot of states have kind of abbreviated that down to just being extension, but the the cooperative uh, part of that is kind of what uh, uh, kind of makes it unique in that it is a partnership with the USDA, the state land grant college, um, mm -hmm. state, and with local governments. And so with that, most counties um, across the Midwest have their own extension office with extension professionals um, in house. Um, that can help with a wide range of issues. In Illinois, our program areas and extension um, include things like 4-H, which is pretty famous uh, with a lot of folks, uh, and what, one of the things we're most known for. But we've got the Ag and Natural Resources area where I've been working uh, throughout my career. We've got the home um, uh, the home, uh, home side of things with family and consumer sciences. And then we've also got community development as one of our main program areas. And a lot of our folks that work in community development are working on the broadband issues um, for their communities as well. So we'll often have a lot of our extension staff will be on some of these uh, task forces around the state that are, are helping communities with their broadband issues. Um, as a, an ag educator and now as a digital ag specialist, um, I've been working in the precision ag area since uh, the technology uh, started uh, becoming available. And I guess the key piece of that at first was the, the, uh, the GPS network that allowed us to get location information. And then we could start creating these uh, maps um, and tying agronomic information in with a location so we could start building up this, some of these data sets that have become quite huge. Um, and that led us into to variable rate technology, where we could take uh, soil samples that have been uh, taken with the GPS coordinates assigned to them. Um, and so we know the actual soil levels and spots all across the field, and then create an application map um, that we can take out a prescription. Um, so we're not just going out and applying a one rate of fertilizer to the entire field. We're applying rates that are based on the actual soil needs. Um, so we're matching up 
our inputs to the actual need of the crop. Uh, that has some great vi environmental benefits, and it's also got productivity benefits to, to the farmer. Um, yield monitors came in right after that um, so that we could start um, analyzing the results of some of these processes. Um, and uh, some of the first yield monitors didn't even have GPS on them. And uh, we were working with farmers to try to get GPS added to them so they could have that information because it's just a critical piece of, of information as farmers are trying to make decisions. And that's that's kind of the base that we had with um, uh, precision ag that we've started with and now we're going past that um, with some of the newer technologies and at the university of illinois we're very fortunate to have something called the center for digital agriculture um, which is um, an administrative collaboration between uh, the college of engineering and the college of agriculture um, to set up a network and a place for the these researchers and faculty members to, to work together on projects so we've got some of the best minds in artificial intelligence and uh, computer science, uh, working with our agronomists and animal scientists and ag economists on projects and competing for USDA grants um, that are enabling us to do a lot of research on some cool things uh, for agriculture in the future. Um, one of the big things is the AI Farms Institute, um, where um, we're doing work on uh, foundational AI type things that are focused on agricultural issues and um, a wide variety of things from sensors to smart systems, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, integrating these things with software that so they can communicate to each other, outreach to the community um, and farmers. And because of that, we've also got a section of our U of I research farm that's called the Farm of the Future. It was another grant uh, that we could uh, used to fund a location on our research farm where we can take all these technologies uh, coming out of the research programs and showcase them in the field um, so that farmers can can see them and we can test them on a larger scale. Um, and it's really, really exciting time um, to be involved in some of this stuff. And you, with Illinois, you often think about uh, the corn and soybeans, uh, but some people don't realize that um, while Illinois is occasionally number one in soybeans, um, we are almost we are always number one in pumpkins and horseradish. <laughs> so we have a significant uh, specialty operation here in the state. And so we're also trying to work with those growers so that they can have access to some of this precision technology as well. Well, I should let you go first. No, thank you so much, Dennis. <laughs> now, now I want to ask a question for, for all of you, but let me just hone in with you first. So you said you said mapping and data, and of course my ears perked up. And so could you just talk a little bit about the maps and the data sets that a, a farmer needs to use for precision agriculture and how are they different from quote unquote normal maps or even broadband maps? Like what, what is it that the maps that you're talking about and the data sets you're talking about, what is the information in them and and how does a farmer kind of license them, you know, or make get 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 access to them? So you know we've got the the soil maps like I was talking about. So you've got this this data um, for every soil probe that was taken and sent to the lab has the location associated with it. So you can create that layer of the map. Um, then this, you can do the same thing with the yield monitor from the in the combine. So you can build a map um, that's taken second by second from the combine of what the recorded yield that's coming into that combine is. And so what that allows us to do is once you get that map created, you can look at that field and see how the yield varied across the field, the way it varied uh, by topography in the field or by other practices, um, different changes in inputs. Um, you can see where you know, the planter changed uh, corn hybrids in the middle of the field. You can see a variety of things that go on there. Um, and it enables us to, to to create a historical record of what happened in that field that year. So we can try to analyze those variations and figure out why certain areas may not be yielding the way we want, and then look for other data layers that help us explain that. Um, what is it that's different about those areas that we can use to do that? And then we can start adding in drone images throughout the season that create um, maps of the field um, that could be either visual spectrum with just regular uh, color images, or they could be uh, multispectral images that look at the crop health. Um, and all this stuff is a, is a lot of data. 
Um, so as you're, tr especially if you're trying to communicate these things back to a, a central location from the field, you need to be able to have uh, a high amount of bandwidth to get that done. Let's continue this mapping. I want to hear from Jim and Matt and, and anyone who wants to weigh in. Maps for precision ag, maps for broadband, how are they different? How are they similar? Um, and, and how are they used as elaborating on what Dennis has already said there? Yeah, well, if, if you don't have your, your maps for broadband, you won't have your maps for precision agriculture, <laughs> right? Like one needs to exist before the other. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak to small and medium farms and, and the real practical application that they do with mapping. Um, mostly it's starting with the U.S. soil survey data and then modifying that to what the farms know is correct, right? The, the soil data that everyone kind of starts off with from the USDA was created a couple of decades ago. And along with farming, the type of farming you're doing, as well as the environment, that your soil is exposed to, it's changing. You no, know, it's it's not the same percentage of sand and loam and, and everything else that's in there. So what I see mo most often, um, small, medium-sized farms doing is is adjusting their soil so that it's appropriate. Um, and then the other thing, and this is very real, is the amount of farms that I see in Oregon and Washington that shift from dry farming to irrigation. That is no joke. Um, you know, in Oregon, just about anyone could throw some uh, some hazelnut seeds out. You'd have your own little hazelnut orchard. It rains that much, especially on the west side of the state. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, you can be I, I live in, in Springfield, Oregon, right next to Eugene. I, I work a lot in Oregon and Washington. But the, the rain pattern has changed. And that's just a fact. And places where you could get by with not irrigating, um, you can't anymore. And part of your irrigation is tracking what's down in the soil, checking out your soil moisture and, and everything else. So um, th those other applications with, with drones um, and especially checking out the health of, of um, whatever people are growing, those are, those are wonderful applications and, and they also need robust broadband. But um, even on the, the most basic side, what I see you know, small to medium sized uh, family farms using maps for, it's um, it's amending their soil, keeping track of irrigation, um, you know, just uh, being able to develop their own maps and, and putting a polygon on a map that shows their property, uh, stuff like that. And and the world is changing in farming, and it's changing okay. a lot. You see that with irrigation. Let's Matt, love your thoughts on this. And Laurel, something Jim mentioned that I hadn't heard of before, but I makes total sense. A soil map of the USDA. So let's hear from both of you again. Maps for precision ag and maps for broadband, similar and different, Matt. Yeah, you know, like any good broadband office worth its weight in soybeans, um, we really invest in broadband uh, mapping. And so we've been collecting data from day one in Illinois, so the fall of 2019, working with our provider community, available data sets that, are, that, uh, that we can access, and also increasingly, you know, working with Illinoisans and stakeholders across the state. And so, Drew, you mentioned we are in the midst of our mapping challenge process for BEAD. And so thank you to everybody across Illinois who's leaned into that. Um, but what we would like to do is once we close that mapping challenge process and lock in our map for the use of bead funds, reopen that engagement across the state with a variety of stakeholders, local communities, Illinoisans everywhere, so that not only are we going to be able to continue the progress that we're making as those bead funds continue or start uh, to, to be deployed across the state, but that we're able to overlay various data sets. And I think, you know, vertical assets is an important piece, but also, you know, kind of getting into like the use cases, where do we see precision agriculture, you know, being successfully utilized? What are the, the, the downstream benefits? I want to use our broadband map uh, as a, a, a resource for, you know, researchers, academics, and practitioners who know that broadband central to what they're doing, but that there's a lot else involved too make it available so that we can kind of bring data sets together and have really a complementary view of what's taking place on that, that broadband layer itself. Laurel. Yeah. So as some folks have noted at USDA, we do have a national soil map that farmers can access and is online. But I think one of the beauties and one of the really neat things about precision ag is it kind of also helps the farmers become their own advocates and create their own data. You know, they're able to, um, as was described, be able to within their own farm footprint, 
see what is the yield within certain areas of their farm. Um, I've heard a lot about uh, sensing that farmers utilize to monitor water usage. And so that makes them much smarter about um, how they're utilizing um, watering their fields. Maybe they just always had a, you know, we I watered it every so many days, but they can actually use sensors in their fields today to monitor that. So then they're actually able to use less water than they would have without that. Uh, one of the other things we hear a lot about is monitoring of livestock, where they can actually put monitors on livestock. And then they know if, um, you know, one of their cows gets sick because they can see that. And so it really... Um, I think what I see is that farmers absolutely are utilizing these online resources to help inform them. But I, I think that also part of what Precision Ag does is help them inform themselves based yeah. on their own monitoring, you know, and the use cases explode when you th start thinking about, um, you know, bringing all of this data together, right? And what can a state do if they know what part of their state um, is creating the biggest yield, and that's really coming and derive, you know, being driven by the farmer's own information. Um, but I think part of what I see is that while these farmers can utilize these at these online maps, they also are driving their own data that's helping to inform them about the work that they're doing. So the questions are coming in, and that's very exciting. Please remember to put them in the Q and A tab, um, and uh, Jim's busy answering them, which is great, but but we want to make sure all of the audience and we have audience beyond just uh, watching on Zoom. And so John Rowe has asked about soil moisture mapping and uh, as well as weather stations. Uh, and I think Jim started to answer that a solid use case weather stations in the field are hugely helpful. Uh, Dan Smith asked, what is the number of sensors per acre? Jim, could you just summarize what you started to type in here about how it's hard to nail down sensors per acre and maybe speak to these questions that have been asked about sensors, weather stations, and uh, soil moisture mapping? Sure, it, it depends upon your budget. And I don't think anyone would argue with um, you know free sensors um, or any type of instrumentation but it depends upon your budget, what type of farm you are and, and, and what you have available. So we would often tell people um, that it, it really depends upon, you know, if you don't have an unlimited budget, well, what does your soil look like um, around your farm and where you're farming? Do you have different rates of, um, of soil moisture and how quick the, uh, the, the irrigation is getting into the ground? Those are important. If you have a different soil composition, you're going to want a sensor in just about each in each and every one of those. This is for in the ground sensors primarily. Um, so I would say that depending upon the topography, you know, hills or, or other things like that, um, all that stuff factors into how many acre, how many sensors per acre you need. If you have a really common soil type and a pretty unchallenging flat land, you, you don't need as much. And if you have a bigger operation with covering a whole bunch of different types of, of soil and of course crops and things like that. Yeah, you're, you're gonna need more sensors. Um, most people are on a budget. And so you, you can do a lot with, with just a right. handful of sensors. Does, does it matter? And I'd love uh, Todd's take as well as anyone else's. What about like differences in crop between say soybeans and completely different like wine, okay? Like uh, I know there's some people in the Picasso community who are, uh, you know, great farmers for wine. What is the difference in the type of instrumentation and data you need to do precision agriculture in, in food, crops, commodities as, as dramatically different as those? Well, one of the things that I think that uh, is important in, in this conversation is that you know, we need to have good broadband bandwidth to the to the farm, you know, to the office and the home. But one of the things that we've figured out is we also need to have pretty good connectivity with the field. Because the new uh, equipment that's being manufactured at John Deere and Caterpillar and, and other places, you know, is very dependent upon uh, having that upstream and downstream capability out in the field. And, you know, when our guys farm 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 acres, you know, they can be a long way from, from the home office. And so 
as we as we move forward, we got to make sure that the uh, the technology it's not going to be just one kind, but it's going to have to have a high degree of, of interoperability and okay. be able to talk to each other. And so that's an important piece of the puzzle, I think, to keep in mind. So, yeah, I, I really appreciate you raising this. And I, I was about to uh, say, let's talk a moment about technologies right now. Now, obviously, as, as Matt well knows, uh, the NTIA has openly acknowledged a preference for fiber, right? And there's a lot that's good about fiber and fiber to the home and fiber to the farm. But if we just break down our three broad types of, of broadband, fiber, terrestrial wireless, obviously, you know, coming from some location and being distributed ter terrestrially, and then satellite broadband, okay? And obviously with low earth orbit satellites, we're finally getting a more reasonable price point for broadband. And I don't know if satellite goes to what Todd has just said, but let's ask Matt to address the question of how do you look at fiber versus terrestrial wireless versus satellite, both from the perspective of, you know, people broadband, but, you know, uh, crop broadband. Right. Yeah, Drew, that's, I mean, that's a, a big question, right? And so I think from our standpoint, we want to make sure that we are investing for the long haul. And I think it really does uh, boil down to, you know, a, a robust network uh, and infrastructure that you can scale to meet the needs, not just of today, but of tomorrow. And I think it's not an either or question in much of Illinois. And because it boils down to the uses, you need, you know, robust, reliable, affordable, high performance broadband, you know, at your, your farm office, right? Uh, upload and downloading files, everything that goes with that. But as Todd had mentioned, you got to get it out in the fields as well. And so I'm really proud of some of the work that Illinois counties have done, you know, working with Todd and others, identifying their needs. And, and a number of them have, have put their finger on this. It's not one or the other, it's both. And just make sure that we're using these dollars that we have wisely so that we're not getting short-term gain and leaving a long-term need uh, left un unaddressed. And so, Real quickly, I mean, I think we push out fiber as far as you possibly can, but you don't lose sight of the fact that you need uh, adequate tower propagation and that you're always looking to how you uh, bring in emerging and alternative technologies to complement that fiber build out. That's our approach in a nutshell. I mean, isn't it the case that you absolutely need a wireless component to do farming? And if we're talking about collecting data from sensors, you're not going to have, you know, fiber to the crop, right? I mean, you may have fiber, but, but, and, and, and obviously once you get the fiber to the, the home, you know, you, you want to have a robust Wi-Fi or wireless capacity. So does anyone else want to speak to the, how you actually collect and access the data? Dennis, is this something you've interacted with in your work with precision agriculture? So, I mean, one of the things we're working on right now is some small autonomous robots that will go into the field and do a variety of tasks from seeding cover crops to collecting imagery uh, that could be used for scouting or for uh, crop breeders to take perform measurements based on uh, 3D models that are built with the visual imagery that comes out of these little uh, robots that can run up and down the row. Um, and in the future, if we're looking at, at trying to make this a viable system, um, it would be great to be able to have these things dispatched to remote farm locations um, that could be controlled from the home office, where you could send this rover out into the field to, to check on something. Is the soil dry enough? Are the crops doing well? Um, are there insects in a certain part of the field? Those kind of things. And so you need that field level connectivity to be able to, to manage that kind of a, a workflow. And Drew, I'd like to, to echo uh, what Matt said earlier too, which is that We've got to make sure that as these things get deployed and as this money gets allocated, that whatever options we end up with have to be future proof. Mm -hmm. Because the technology changes, you know, pretty regularly. And we've got to make sure that what we're putting in now is going to last for a while. Well, what I'm and trying to get at, and, and, and I know I'm pushing an issue, and normally I'm on the other side of this. Normally I'm fiber, 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 but like, don't you need a wireless component and, and don't you even really need satellite? I mean, that's kind of what I'm getting at is, is that really the killer? Is this a killer app for satellite broadband, right? As opposed to human broadband, or am I missing something? Is, is terrestrial wireless going to work uh, for doing those agriculture uh, applications? It depends. Okay, on what? <laughs> on where you are. Okay. And I'm what your topography right is now, but... and what your systems are. 
<laughs> because I don't think there's any one solution. And I think we shouldn't wed ourselves to one solution. We need to think about how do we create something that's going to work for the long haul? Because I don't know about you, but I've been watching these kind of programs for a couple decades now. And it's not often that we get this kind of federal investment. Mm -hmm. And so we really shouldn't squander it. Okay. We really ought to make it work. Hey, so Drew. Please go ahead, Laurel. I was just going to say, I think Matt really, from my perspective, I agree with him. It's it's not either. It's really both. Um, and I think also, as other panelists are saying, it really depends on what you're trying to do with the precision ag technology. You know, there are certain things um, that are high bandwidth, you know, you're going to need a really robust network um, and also the ability to take in huge uploaded files, um, which there's some limitations when you're looking at satellite. But when we're thinking about like autonomous tractors today, you know, and other things, you know, that might bring in more of satellite or wireless technology. So I think it, as other folks are saying, some of it just really depends on what you're trying to do. But I think overall, if we're really, our goal is about getting and creating an ability for more precision ag applicability and access for farms, it really is the need for both types of, you know, um, I think both a, a fiber connection as well as some type of a wireless component. Um, but again, it, it just really varies on the size of your farm, what you're trying to do, um, where you're located. Um, and I, I think all of that kind of comes into play. All right. We've got a question from Garland McCoy about, uh, and he's been raising this point about uh, augmenting GPS. Uh, GPS is not accurate. You need RTK NTP network support. I don't know what that means. So Dennis, you've raised your hand. You want to answer this question. Tell me your answer to Garland's question here about augmenting GPS. So traditional GPS, um, especially when it first started, was notoriously um, sloppy about determining your location. That you know, if you were in a, a ten yard radius, um, that was probably pretty considered really good to start with. Um, but now we've got, um, in addition to the United, the American constellation of GPS satellites, we also have the Russian constellation, the European constellation, and uh, the Chinese constellation. And so modern GPS equipment can access all of those satellites to try to get an improved uh, signal. And that will often get us down to less than a foot on a consistent basis. But if we're trying to get down to that inch or centimeter level, we need uh, a a correction, which we can get from an art, what's called an RTK system. So that's a dedicated base station that's also collecting uh, the GPS information, but it's surveyed in, so it knows its location. And if the GPS signal is saying you're three feet over that way, it says, no, I'm not, um, and sends out a correction notice to any receivers in that area that can be connected to it. And that's, that's the RTK system. A lot of states, have free RTK networks, um, often done by their state departments of transportation. Illinois is one of the states that does not have a statewide RTK system. It's a big deficit that we have here in Illinois. Um, there are some private RTK systems out there. There's also an open source RTK system of uh, users that are trying to build their own uh, RTK uh, network. Um, but it is it is something that um, uh, a lot of the equipment companies make their own RTK networks available to their clients um, as part of the fee for that equipment. So uh, that RTK uh, fine-tuned GPS signal is is kind of one of the keys to some of the modern technology as well. We'll have Just to get like Matt, we we'll have to get Matt on that task there. But but uh, finishing this one point, Dennis Hawk also asks about is this similar to uh, Deer and company building a network to allow a 15 miles per hour versus five mile hour is is that is that connected is it, or Dennis is that a separate issue? No, it, well, it, it that planter has to have that kind of an RTK right. system to be able to um, to do to manage that technology, and so it's got to process that location signal extremely fast um, to keep that tractor right on path. 
So it's some, yeah. the, you know, the modern equipment is getting some really high computing power. Um, the modern John Deere C and spray system um, has one of the biggest computers on any piece of mobile equipment around. Wow. Matt, I'm probably joking and joshing you here, but but speak just a bit more about the network of of entities and you know, uh, did you, you mentioned a digital agriculture group? Could you just speak about how these uh, institutions and infrastructure, intellectual infrastructure, so to speak, are helping support the Illinois broadband effort? Well, just real quickly, I think it's important for our office to recognize that we're not operating in a vacuum, and you know, we got the the challenge process, so we want to engage Illinoisans everywhere on that. But also just recognizing that we should identify needs and in use cases and ways in which we can collaborate. And I think that the program that, that that Todd has led in engaging counties across the state, setting goals, how they want to use this historic investment in broadband uh, to to optimize you know outcomes and put them in a position to compete in the 21st century on agriculture and other you know, uh, uses is just so critically important. And so, I mean, I think that that's what this really boils down to is just cast a wide net. Uh, broadband is the start of the conversation. There is so much that critically depends on it. And so I, I look forward to the follow-ups on, you know, you know work from home and, uh, and uh, um, you know, smart sh- streets and all of that that follows. But the point here is the precision egg. I mean, this is, we're, we're talking about real life applications and benefits that are prime for this investment uh, that the bead program is bringing to us. And so if I could just say, I, I saw in the chat box, there was a question, you know, what can local communities or others do to help the bead program perform on precision agriculture? And it really boils down to this, get in the game, you know, get yeah. together, set goals, make sure that precision agriculture and the uses of broadband are articulated at the local level and set that expectation for your state broadband office, but also for your local providers and those folks who are going to be bidding on bead dollars. From my standpoint, I want to see applications come to us for bead funds that highlight the use of precision agriculture and what an investment in 21st century broadband is going to deliver for that ag community in this case. And so, Drew, thanks again for the opportunity here. Well, our our time is zoomed by, uh, and I want to give each of you a chance to offer some last uh, comments, but I want to put in a question of my own, and then there's still four more questions uh, on the Q&A tab that you can take any one of them. The question of mine is, could could either of any of you speak to the, t- the Precision Ag Task Force of the FCC and the USDA? What is its deliverables? What is it doing to help? Is there money specifically for Precision Ag and... Uh, you know how to how do uh, our listeners get get access to it? So that's my question for the group. Let's just go in the same order we went in uh, and take whatever questions you want of the, this group. So Jim, sure. Uh, well, the precision the precision ag task force is really going to be advising on the farm bill. Um, their meetings are public. You can find all their agenda and and minutes from stuff. I want to tack back to a moment when we were talking about different technologies. Um, I don't think we talked enough about satellite during the Zoom. We could have a whole other Zoom <laughs> that's about satellite. That's a game changer in rural areas where you don't have flat land and you're in the mountains. That is an absolute game changer. It's not uncommon for a ranch to have two or three different uh, Starlink um, satellites, and that's pretty expensive. And they're willing to pay that because it's that important. So John Deere partner with Starlink, that's really important. And, and satellite is doing a lot. So it's it's all of the above on the technology to get broadband there. Great, Laurel. Yeah, so the task force um, does not have money necessarily to finance precision ag technology or, or uses in the farm. Um, what it's been doing is really advising both USDA and FCC on policies that they can adopt or changes to existing policies that can better support precision ag. Um, and so um, we've, they, as, as uh, was mentioned, they do hold uh, public meetings so you can access um, and participate in those. They've also produced a number of reports, uh, which are really informative and talk about where the technology is going. And again, what specifically FCC and USDA can do to best support um, the adoption of precision agriculture uh, from our farming communities. Okay, awesome. Matt? Just real quick, I think we've got experts who put a lot of time into putting that report together. And so take it seriously. There's some specific things that we can rally around to move the dial forward. Todd? 
Uh, I would just echo what uh, what Laurel and Matt and, and Jim have said. Um, and I know we're, we're getting short on time. So, uh, Drew, I wanted to thank you for putting this together. I think it was a great, great panel and great lively discussion. And, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you. And Dennis, you get the last word. Thanks for bringing so much to this discussion. Well, I want to thank everybody here for their efforts on broadband because uh, as a as a benefit of fiber finally came to my 1,500-person uh, little town here in central Illinois, uh, which enabled me to, come to participate in this event today from my home office. So thank you. Well, that's awesome. It's been great to have this discussion and sort of be there uh, remotely, virtually in, in, in Illinois at the start of the planning season. Uh, don't don't forget next week, another sort of ruralish topic uh, on Broadband Breakfast Live Online, but you have to set your clocks earlier and come at 11 o'clock instead of our normal 12 noon time. On behalf of our panelists, uh, Jim, Laurel, Matt, Todd, and Dennis, I'm Drew, and we will see you next week. Take care, everyone.